There are two main ways to edit 360 degree footage, on PC or Mac, and then on mobile. I use both depending on where I am editing, rendering, and uploading my final project. If you aren't already a keen editor with a setup, I highly recommend you just take the mobile route. It's faster, easier, and cheaper. However, my method works for both. I use an Insta360 1R, but this method translates to other 360 degree cameras. I'm not sponsored or in any way affiliated with Insta360. I did my research, chose what was best for me, and paid for it with my own money. Let's cover filming. Regardless of what you're filming on, you should always shoot intentionally. If you don't know why you're filming, then don't. Every unnecessary minute of footage you film multiplies the time of your edit. 360 especially so. Film intentionally, check you got the shot, and then move on. Make sure the frame rate matches what you want to output your final project in and that of any other cameras you might be using. I have mine set to 24 FPS because that is what has been determined by the industry as the best frame rate to use. Especially in the case of 360 cameras, you want as much data per frame as possible. So any higher frame rates, you have to spread your bandwidth across more frames. If you like color grading, shoot in flat, you get higher dynamic range. If not, just use their standard profile. Now we're onto the processing side of things. Step one is obviously to do your data management. Get the footage that you've taken onto the device that you're going to edit on. For mobile friendly 360 cams, such as the Insta360 or GoPro Max, you can connect directly with the camera and only download the clips that you need. Insta360 take it one step further and let you edit directly off the device. This means that all that will be on your phone will be your final renders which is very efficient. For Mac or PC, plug the SD card straight in and start transferring the files into your file structure. Make sure you take everything from the action cam. For the case of Insta360, if you copy across the individual clips and not the whole file structure, and then you format your card, you will not be able to move those clips back and then edit through the app if you wanna use some of the powerful effects that they have in their app editing suite. I will have a video in the future on my full data management process, so stay tuned for that. Next, we're gonna talk about the whole process of stitching, framing, and editing your 360 footage. The mobile apps are fairly straightforward, so I'm not going to cover them in depth. They will stitch your footage together automatically, allowing you to then choose your aspect ratio and the framing that you want. All you need to do after that is cut your clips to size and then render them out. From here, you can import them on your mobile into your favorite editing app. For computers, there are many approaches to stitch, frame, and export your 360 footage, especially if you want to put your footage into your preferred editing program to add to a full timeline. If you don't have one of these and are looking to make a more complex edit, I highly recommend DaVinci Resolve. I've put a link in the description. The non-studio version is free to use. The most efficient way to stitch and edit your 360 footage is to do it immediately in the application that your device comes with. In my opinion, neither DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut, or Premiere Pro have a decent 360 degree editing workflow. Because I have an Insta360, I use Insta360 Studio. Here, I cut and edit each individual clip that I want for my full timeline on DaVinci Resolve. The advantage of doing this all before putting it in your main program is that you can run the heavy 5.3K or dual 2K unstitched 360 files with relative ease. The user interface and the whole program is designed to work with 360, so it's much more intuitive. If you find that your computer can't manage the software that your 360 cam came with, just use your mobile. Especially if you're on iPhone, it's one of these scenarios where the technology just works better, even though in theory, your computer is probably more powerful. A small advantage of doing it all the renders on your phone, even if you're going to then export it onto your computer to edit, is that you can do it in your spare moments and you can do it whilst your computer's rendering something to maximize your efficiency. This method is the most efficient because it means that you only view and process the footage once, as well as only rendering what you actually need. It is also the most direct path, which means that you will lose the least amount of quality from your shot. Although your image is probably 5K and around 100 megabits a second, which sounds like a lot, once you've reframed that to a normal viewing angle, you are most likely looking at a low bitrate 1080p or 720p image. We will talk about the best export settings later. 
I often have multiple cameras on a shoot. If you have your A-roll on a different camera, edit and place this first. There is no point in going through your footage, framing and rendering a load of shots that don't end up actually getting used. The biggest advantage of editing on a 360 camera is that you're framing it after the fact. This opens up the world to perfectly tracking subjects, but also doing perfect pan whip transitions without any planning. Use this to your advantage. To achieve this, follow the following tutorial. <laughs> Make sure you know which clip is leading into the next clip. At the end of your first clip, pan whip the camera by using keyframes into the direction that you want the next clip to pick up on. On the following clip, do the same but at the beginning. Lead in from the direction that you led out from in the previous clip and flick the view in to where you want it to end up. You can then either cut these clips in the program or if you're going to be editing this later, leave that extra space and it just means that once it's on your timeline you can choose the best places to cut. Here's a recent cool little edit I did using this technique. There are two other main approaches I'm aware of that you could try using. Here's my experience on those. At first I thought I could skip having to frame all my stuff or use it in a different program or render it off before importing it into Premiere Pro. You can edit the raw 360 individual files you've got from each lens by using the GoPro FX plugin. I'll put a link to where this is available in the Insta360 store. However, I found that the stitching wasn't as neat as if I did it in the Insta360 Studio software, and I occasionally had issues with how the footage was stabilized. On top of this, even if you have a more powerful PC, you're going to have to be rendering your timeline at an eighth quality, and then rendering your timeline out once you've made your changes in order to watch it smoothly. To further prove the point that this is not an efficient route to take, Premiere Pro continuously crashed as I tried to render out this timeline, which had previously been fine. Premiere Pro's instability does have to be taken into account when you're deciding how you're gonna do your workflow. On top of this, you'll find that your final export times are gonna be significantly slower than a normal render. When I tried this method, I found that the overall process was actually slower, especially as you can leave your footage stitching and rendering overnight in your 360s software. If you're sleeping, your computer probably isn't doing anything anyways. So there's not really any time loss there. Let's talk about that option. With this, you could stitch with your 360 footage without framing it and move it to your preferred editing program to frame and cut. While this works, it's inefficient. You have two paths of approach. One is that you could go through and view all your 360 degree footage to choose and cut out the bits that you want to render. However, you're then gonna have to do that again in order to frame your footage once it's in your editing program. To get around that, you can render everything out so all your footage is stitched and then do everything in your preferred program. But for various reasons we're gonna explain later, you're gonna be rendering this in ProRes, which means you could end up with hundreds of gigs of extra files in your storage. On top of this, you need to make sure that when your machine is using that program, it can actually manage 5K files with the effect on that allows it to be edited like a 360 image rather than an equatriangle normal image. However, if you want to go to town with your edit, this is the best approach. I did this for a water rafting trip that I filmed in entirely in 360 and it enabled me to do some really fun transitions. Unless you're filming with a really decent 360 setup, the chances are that the actual image you get out of your 360 camera is pretty terrible, especially if you've got a proper camera on the same timeline. This means you should really be rendering out your clips in ProRes. Regardless of whether you're editing your full 360 degree clip in your timeline or the piece you've cut out and reframed. ProRes is a far more edit friendly codec, so it will be easier for your computer to run. However, it does use significant more space. Assuming that you went with my main method and you've got your finalized framed and rendered shots, you can now import them into your preferred application. This approach has saved me so much time and stress, I can't even put it into words. I hope it will help you get your mind around how you're gonna edit your 360 footage and feel free to let me know if you have any questions on this process down in the comments. Thanks for your time. See you soon.